I want to show you some cool stuff that I basically just figured out uh, two or three weeks ago, and um, we have already ha we are already having this in production. So um, and we are currently doing a huge migration, basically killing off our entire REST API and switching it over to GraphQL. So um, I really want to share my enthusiasm, and you know, hopefully someone else is, uh, can see the 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 you know the positive things about this and use it in your own projects as well. Um, so I want to show two technologies today. One is GraphQL, the other one is uh, Apollo. GraphQL is kind of one piece of the puzzle is on the back end. Apollo is the other piece of the puzzle. If you use uh, some JavaScript front end like um, Angular or ReactJS or React Native or just vanilla JavaScript, you can use Apollo as your client side. Uh, piece of the puzzle. So Apollo will talk to GraphQL, and GraphQL will answer with data, and Apollo will make sure that the data is uh, distributed to all your components. If you want to get an introduction to these two technologies, the best starting point is obviously the official website. And actually, the GraphQL website is so cool, I don't really need to create any slides, because they've already done it. Um, so we're essentially like, OK, what's GraphQL? And you look at it, and it's like, OK, it's a query language for your API. Mm -hmm. Query language sounds like SQL and stuff like that. So how does the query language look like? right? And you see it here. It looks a little bit like a JavaScript object. So you basically say, OK, I want to query a hero, and I'm only interested in the fields name and height and whatever. And the response that you will get looks like this. So it's essentially a JSON string that has the same structure as the query that you were requesting. And you can, you know, you can have nested queries. Maybe Maybe uh, the hero has a parent, and that is also of a type human. So you can, you know, with using the brackets, you can go deeper and deeper and deeper, and the response will look the same as well, also going deeper in the same way. Okay? Um, so, I mean, writing queries like this is really easy. You don't need to know anything about database design, SQL, joins, foreign keys, all that stuff. Anybody can understand these kind of queries, right? Um, another thing is, you have only one endpoint. When you think about classic REST APIs, you have hundreds of endpoints, probably. And the developer, every day when they start working and they're like, OK, I need to fix something on that uh, shop grid. <coughs> OK, what was the shop grid endpoint again? Is it all products, own products, product slash something? So you have to go into your source code or look at your API documentation, find the correct endpoint, and then learn about what uh, get parameters are possible and what response will I get back, right? And this is really painful. It slows me down as hell every day at work. So with GraphQL, you only have one endpoint, slash API or slash GQL or slash GraphQL, whatever you want. And um, your application, basically, these days, if you use something like React.js uh, uh, or React Native, is, con is, is basically a composition of hundreds of small components, right? In React, you build tons of components. And each of these components, they will have small queries of you know, these kinds of queries here of the data that they want to consume. Like, imagine you have a website on, a, on the top right corner, there's an avatar icon, and the avatar needs like the <coughs> URL of the picture and maybe first name, last name to render that at the, at the top of the website. So you would write a query like user, first name, last name, avatar thumbnail, or something like that, right? And you have tons of components, and they all have these queries. Uh, with normal REST APIs, when I open my LuxGlove mobile app, it sends 15 HTTP requests to my API. I mean, I should probably optimize that somehow. But you know, most people who just start goofing around with mobile apps, they will, they will do it like this, right? With GraphQL, I only have one request. Because Apollo, the client, will batch all the requests in, uh, in a queue. And every 10 milliseconds, it will take all of them and merge them into one huge thing that looks like this, right? So I will have tons of small components. They all have small queries like this. This can be combined into one big string that contains everything. And it will be like one request that is sent to your GraphQL backend and one response coming back with all the data that you have requested. Also, with classic uh, REST API endpoints, when I go to like slash products and I, I get a list of all my products, usually I get like 70 fields. I have like our database is pretty big these days. And uh, we have lots and lots of uh, potential kinds of information that we store for each product. And my REST endpoint, it returns just everything about that product. Even though, when you have to shop grid, what, what do I see? Picture, price, title. That's it. And then you click into the product, and then you want to see all these other 50 things, right? And here, you just define exactly what you want. And, and what's 
being sent back over the wire is exactly what you have requested and nothing more. So you not only save requests, which is like HTTP requests have to be built up, it's overhead all the time, you also save bandwidth and you save space on the device because it's lesser data that you have to save in memory, right? So this is pretty awesome. Um, Basically, the people on the back end, and I won't talk about this today, their task is to create the schema to describe how your data looks like. And it doesn't matter what database you are using. It could be Postgres, it could be MySQL, it could be MongoDB, it could be, there could be even some endpoints here with fields that you are taking from the Twitter API. So, you know, your API could talk, uh, talk to another API and you can still query it in the same way like here, right? Um, because under the hood, on the back end, what people will write in whatever language they use, um, these, are, these things resolve by using normal programming functions. And you can do in those functions whatever you want. You can do, it, you can do a SQL query or you can do a request to some other endpoint. Okay? Um, so basic, oh, okay. And um, because we have this schema here, um, GraphQL understands how you're, what data you have and there is a small um, web um, tool it's like an IDE that allows you to try out these queries. And while you type, it gives you uh, code completion. And because it understands that there's something like all films in your schema, and it has name and climate and whatever, OK, here, this is a planet, it will, when you say, give me all films, and then for each film, give me title and um, opening crawl, whatever this means here. So it, while you're typing this, it already shows you what fields are available. You don't ever have to look at any documentation. You could throw a new developer at your project, don't tell them anything, just give them this, and they type the first opening bracket, and they see whatever is, what endpoints are available, right? They choose an endpoint, they type the next bracket, they see what, uh, what, what type is in there, they type a bracket again, they see what fields are available, so, so to speak, what columns are available in your database, right? You could just press the docs button here, okay, now it's here, and you can see what, what are my endpoints in each endpoint, what is the return value, what uh, data types are each field in those return values. So, and, I, and you don't have to write a single line of code to get this kind of documentation. So um, believe me, when you use this, your like, efficiency will skyrocket immediately, right? Okay, I hope I could, uh, I have sold you on this. <laughs> um, so the other piece of the puzzle is, okay, that's a backend, right? And we are not here today uh, for backend stuff. We are here for frontend stuff and JavaScript stuff. So um, Facebook invented all this um, and they, they released something called Relay. I tried Relay like two months ago when I already understood that this will be good for me, but I totally failed. And like after four hours, I still couldn't get my React components to render anything from my database, so I gave up. I ran it on Twitter, and then everybody on Twitter said, hey, bro, why don't you just use Apollo? It's like Relay, but easier. So I tried that two <laughs> weeks ago, and it was easier indeed, right? After like 20 minutes, I, I could see something, and then I ran down the rabbit hole, and now I'm sitting here. Um, so. The Apollo documentation is quite okay. You basically choose what front-end uh, framework you're using, and then you know just follow the initial steps, how to install. Uh, usually these, these things here, usage examples, th these are the ones in the documentation that you want to read about. Um, and then uh, you might, might uh, need to dig deeper every now and then. You will go here into the API reference and learn how it works internally more under the hood to do some more magic stuff like pagination and so on. Um, okay. So much about the introduction. Um, so basically in this talk, I will mostly copy and paste code from my slides into my editor um, because I'm too slow at typing to get this done in half an hour. And basically, if you want to try this at home, you can just get these slides um, and you basically you know, do the same that I'm doing right now here. So I basically want to show you it's possible. <laughs> you can try this. You know? um, first of all, um, if you clone this repository, you will have to install a virtual environment with Python. So you need to understand a little bit about Python. So just Google that, uh, install all the requirements, and then you should be able to run a local Python server. Uh, that should look something like this. So manage PyRun server, and you should be able to go to this URL, and you should be able to go to graphical, and you know, and then you're like, hmm, what endpoints are there, right? So, okay, there's some endpoint that gives me all messages and one endpoint that gives me one message. So when I go to all messages, let's prettify that. Uh, all right, what else do I need to do? Okay, there's something like edges and something like node. I don't really know what it means. Aha, this is what I need, ID, creation date. So these are the database columns that my message table provides, right? When I execute this, I'm getting a JSON string 
with all my messages in my database, all right? So, um, and this is how I would start working, essentially. I decide what, I, what kind of uh, a component I want to work on today, and I figure out what query do I need so that this component can render its data, figure out the query here, and when I'm done, I'm copy and paste that query into my actual code. So we, see, we will see that later. Um, so basically, the, this Django server that I provide in the repository is just so that you have a Graph, GraphQL API backend available for you to play around with. And it only has these three endpoints, like all messages, one message, and create new message. We will see that in, in, at the end. So, um, so if you wanted to now you know, start using React.js and Apollo, first thing you need to do is create a React.js application. And these days, this is pretty easy. You can do npm install global uh, create React app, and then you execute create React app, and you give it a name. So you would do that. Uh, when you clone my repository, right, there is already a front-end folder. You can delete that folder and then start from scratch again doing this, right? I don't want to do this now because it downloads a lot of stuff from NPM. So I just imagine um, I've already, I've just done um, create react app front-end, okay? And it creates the front-end folder. That's all it does, okay? So let's go into that folder. And if it has worked, you should be able, uh, sorry, you should be able to do yarn start. And this will open your browser, and there is your React.js application that doesn't do anything right now, okay? So this is how you can start a new React project. But we want to use Apollo, and I want to show uh, a list of items, and then you click into one item, you see the detail view, and I want to have another uh, page in my app where you can create a new message. So we need three pages. And for that, something like React Router is commonly used, so we also need to install React Router. So while you are here in your front-end folder, uh, we are in front-end, you would do yarn at um, React Router DOM and React Apollo. I, I've already done that, so I won't do that again. Oh, did I actually do that? Yarn at React Router DOM. Okay, maybe not, I'm not sure. Okay, so we are still in the setup phase of our project, right? We are still not really doing anything related to um, Apollo and GraphQL. But we should have installed all the necessary prerequisites at this point in time. And now we need to you know, make sure that this default React application that we can see here um, show something that we actually build ourselves. So um, I will basically um, remove these imports here and I will remove whatever is in here. And you know, the beauty of this create React app is, uh, did I stop the server? Yeah, I did. The beauty would have been <laughs> that it automatically refreshes whenever you save your file. Um, all right, so now it's empty. And the first thing that we need to do when, when we want to start using this awesome Apollo and GraphQL stack and React Router, we need to add a bunch of imports at the top of our file, okay? So we always have in every React.js application, we have the React import at the very top. Um, and then here we have to import three things that are related to Apollo. Here we have to import th three things that are related to React Router. And here is our uh, three views that we want to build today. These files don't exist right now, okay? Um, so we have these imports. Then we have to do some boilerplate code that, you know, I don't even know what it does. Uh, this is what you find on the, on the Apollo tutorial uh, on their official website. So essentially, um, we have to use this uh, create batching network interface function to create a network interface. And we have to tell it, and this is the important part, where, what is the URL of our GraphQL endpoint, so of, of your backend server, right? Um, this is the batching that I mentioned. When you have a lot of components with lots of queries, they will be put into a queue. And you can define how many milliseconds uh, Apollo should wait before it grabs all the queries, merges them into one big one, and sends them to the server. So if you have some kind of app like a game or whatever that generates like requests on, on a per millisecond basis, but you don't really need to send all these requests in real time, you could you know, set the batch value to some milliseconds value here. And this, is, uh, this allows you to send additional HTTP headers to your server. Um, let's ignore that for today. Um, and then you just in, in create an instance of Apollo client. 
And then, uh, this is on the next slide, we will replace our render function with this fancy code. Okay, I have some syntax errors. Oh yeah, yeah, this is because of my slides. Okay. What's the problem here? Render return. That should be fine. Okay, there's one bracket missing. All right. So we have told Apollo where our API endpoint is, and we have this uh, Apollo client instantiated. And now we essentially wrap our entire React application uh, in between this Apollo provider component. And we pass in the client that we have instantiated into that component. Who cares what this does below the hood, right? It works and it looks beautiful, so just do it. Um, same for React Router. Um, you basically have to wrap your entire app in between React Router component. Unfortunately, the React Router component can only have one child component, so I cannot do this. This would mean we have one, two childs, like route and switch, right? We have to put one diff around everything. And then here, basically, React Router with version 4, with the new API, works like this. Um, if the current URL is slash, then at this space, at this position in our HTML code, like right behind this diff, render the home view component, okay? But if the URL is messages create, then we will render that component. So it kind of switches on and off which component is currently rendered, okay? Um, and this switch thing, um, let's ignore it for today. It's basically because these two routes here, they could be the same. If you go to messages slash create, messages slash ID is also a match because this is a variable part in my URL, right? And maybe slash create is the variable part in my URL. So, um, and then, you know, I was like, hey, why, why is this displaying both components at the same time? And then I looked into the React Router um, documentation. I figured out if you use switch, it goes down the list one by one. And if it finds a match, it stops. And it only renders the component that it has found. So this way, you can make sure if you have ambiguous routes that could be like overlapping, that it only renders the one that it finds first. OK? So this is like a typical like all my React applications and also my React native applications, the outermost uh, entry point of your app looks always something like this. All these kinds of wrapper components that add magic to your application, okay? Um, okay, so this will still not work because we have been importing three files that don't exist right now. So I create a folder, uh, views, and I create three files, um, home view, JS and detail view and create view. All right. And I mean, these views are supposed to be uh, React components. So we need to put a little bit of code inside so that they just do anything at all. So I just changed the name of the class. And I put some title here so that I can distinguish them when, when we test them. Uh, so we will have home view. And finally, hey, where's my detail view? And while I was doing all this, it kept refreshing in the background. But just now there was an error message, right? And now suddenly it's, it's working again. I love this. So um, I could go to messages one, and it's the detail view rendering now. I could go to messages create, and it's the create view rendering, right? And I can just go to the home page, and it's the home view rendering. So like our app skeleton is up and running. So this is kind of the painful stuff that took us 10 minutes uh, that you need to do every time you start a new React project. But you know, it's not, it's not that hard, right? Um, OK, so now we can do the uh, exciting things. So we want to learn about Apollo, right, and GraphQL. So first thing we want to do is, how do I query some data? I want to see some data out of my database on my website, right? So let's start with the home view. First thing you do is, you import GQL and GraphQL from React Apollo. And GQL is basically, um, I don't know, it's just like a function that um, requires this kind of um, JavaScript string literal. And this is exactly the query that in the morning when I started working, uh, 
I figured out in the graphical editor, right? You can copy and paste this exact query into here, all right? Um, so, and then we need to change our render function to actually use the data that we now uh, have accessible in our component. So let me paste in this new render function. So, all right, so ha who has used React.js? Let's quick show of hands. Oh, wow, that's good. That's like maybe 60%. Um, so most people will be um, familiar with this kind of syntax. Each React component, right, has these properties. Inside of this class, I can always use this.props. So these are things that have been passed into the component by some outside component, okay? Um, so basically, like, if, if I would do something um, like this, um, diff um, info equals hello, then, and let's say this was my own diff component, then I could do this.props.info inside of my own diff component, right? So this is how you have to imagine how the properties work. And um, because of GraphQL, we will have a field called data. Like we will have this.props.data available in our component because we enhanced our component with GraphQL, uh, with Apollo, okay? Um, and the cool thing is data is another JavaScript object that has lots and lots of information in it. And one part is loading. So while your request is still in flight, loading is gonna be false. And when the request came back, uh, loading is gonna be true. And when the request came back, loading will turn to false, right? And every time a property changes, the render function will be called again. This is how React works. So in the beginning, when you first load your page, there is no data, so the query will be sent, loading will be true, and we will just return some, you know, loading stuff. This is kind of like when you go to the Facebook uh, homepage, you can see in the timeline that there are these gray boxes, like these fake posts, while it's still loading. And this is the kind of stuff that you would return here, right? You would return some kind of fake representation of the data that you will show soon, but it's not there yet, okay? So once loading is done, we, we instead of rendering this, we will render this, right? And uh, so, and we will have now access to this.props.data. All messages, which is the name of the endpoint that we have queried here, okay? And then we know that we have to do dot .edges dot .node to get to the actual item. And edges is a list of items, so we can map over that list. And for each item in that list, we will render a, a paragraph and put a link inside um, so that we can click into that item. Uh, so, so in this case, item is one edge, right? And we know that inside an edge, there is node. So I will have to do item.node.id. So this ID is basically the data that I have requested, right? And this message down here is also the data that I have requested in my query, all right? Um, so hopefully, huh, oh yeah, yeah. That, that happened when I tried this uh, earlier. <laughs> so I'm prepared for this. <laughs> Huh, I'm not prepared for this. <laughs> Loading of undefined. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, we need to go to the next slide first. Um, or actually, we need to paste everything in this slide. Um, so the last part of the puzzle is, this component currently doesn't know anything about this query, right? This is just a stupid React component, doesn't know anything about Apollo or whatever. So, um, and this is why we imported GraphQL. We, we use GQL to create our query. GraphQL is kind of a function wrapper or decorator or however you want to call it. And unfortunately, um, you could use this GraphQL query if you are like bleeding edge, uh, super modern ES, whatever syntax. Um, but when you use create React app on the command line, uh, the bubble config or, or the ESLint config is configured in such a way that you cannot use the decorator syntax yet. So. Unfortunately, this would be like super beautiful. We have to do it uh, in the manual way. So we call the GraphQL function, we put in our query variable, right? And we wrap our uh, React component into that. So now this GraphQL magic is wrapped around our component and this makes sure that this .props data and all this magic is available. Um, and hopefully, bam, we can see data, okay? Um, so now, the next thing you will ask yourself, hmm, how do I create queries where certain parts are variable? Like, if we go to this URL, 
this part of the URL is dynamic, right? This, this, this um, dictates what kind of data I have to query from my database. Uh, this is like the ID of the object, okay? Um, <clears throat> and we can do that pretty simply. So this is gonna be our detail view. And once again, first thing we do is we put the query in here, and now it looks a bit different. We have to write the keyword query, and we have to say, this is a query for my detail view. And actually, you can come up with any name. You could also call this um, product detail or anything, right? Um, I haven't really come up with a good best practice yet how to name these things, so I like to name them in the same name like the component is. Like, this is the query for this component, right? So, so far, this has worked for me pretty well. And I'm saying that this query has variables. Okay, and it means there's one variable that's called ID, and the type is this special kind of um, GraphQL ID. So you see these weird strings here; Th those are GraphQL uh, IDs. Um, you could have more things, like you could say uh, this thing also has I don't know limit, and it's an int, and it's, an it's a mandatory field. So this is how you define your variables, and then there comes the bracket. And then is the normal way how you would query things from your endpoints, right? So you would usually go in here. You can basically exactly the same thing that you just saw there. We can also write it down here. So we can say a query, uh, any name, oh wait, sorry, query, any name needs a variable ID of type ID is mandatory. And when I execute this query, um, I want to call my message endpoint and I want to query filter by ID using my ID variable, okay? And uh, whatever I get back, I want to have the ID, the creation date, and the message. So I can't run that yet because there is no variable, okay? So when you have queries with variables, you need to define them down here in the variable window. And once again, it's super smart. It already detects what variables I defined up here and suggests them for me. And then you just fill in the variable, and you run your query, and voila, you get your data. And then you copy and paste this whole thing into your React code, and it, it will work just like that. So uh, the other way around is usually the case. You try typing it here, and it doesn't work. And then you're like, damn, why doesn't it work? And then you go to graphical, you paste it in here, and you get some nice error messages here, OK? Um, so that's the first step. We define our query. Second step, again, is to use the new data in our render function. All right. So same thing, right? While my query is still in flight, I'm rendering some loading stuff. Once I got my data, I have access to data. Uh, so this.props.data and dot message because that is the endpoint, the GraphQL endpoint that I've queried, right? And then dot ID, creation date, message, because those are the fields that I have requested. So I have exactly that data available in my HTML markup, when, in my render function, okay? Um, and then I probably still, f oh yeah, yeah. So the decorator part is a bit more tricky now. All right. <coughs> So we have to read this from the bottom up. Just like before, we are using the GraphQL decorator, right? We are passing in our query, and in this case, we are passing in another JavaScript object with some extra data, some options for my query. And then we wrap our component in that wrapper function, okay? So far, so good. So how does this other extra options uh, object look like? So it's a JavaScript object, and it has a key options. And this can be an anonymous function. So this syntax here might confuse a few people. This, oh, sorry. This basically means um, options isn't just a string or whatever. This is actually an anonymous function. And the first parameter of that function is the properties of my component. OK? And so this function returns another JavaScript object where the first key is variables. And then uh, my, I have one variable called ID. And I'm now using props.match.params.id. So this is because of React Router, OK? Because uh, we wrapped our entire application in between React Router. React Router does some cool magic and makes sure that all my components have this.props.match 
available. And if my URL had any variable parts, so like if you use this colon something, right, this is uh, one of the params. So I have dot match dot params dot ID. All right. So that means this is how I can access this outside information from the URL. I'm getting it into my React component. And now I'm passing it into my, my query variables for GraphQL to consume. OK? Um, so let's see. Oh, wow. It already uh, updated itself. So we can now go into each of our things here, and it will display the value from the database. OK? And now this is something that I want to show you. So I refreshed the no, no, let's, let me go to the home page first. So I refresh the page. I get one request for GraphQL, OK? And I get back the result. I go into the first object. It's another request against my web server. I go back to this page, no more requests. Because Apollo, um, because Apollo uh, remembers what kind of uh, data types are, uh, do I have? So in our case, it's the message object. And what IDs do they have? And it keeps a cache of all of them. Okay? So if I go into the second one, we, we have never seen that one yet. So it's another, it's another request. If I go back to the home page, no more requests. If I go into the third one, it's another request. And now, no matter what I do, I click around in my app, no more requests. But right? everything is in cache. So that you get all this magic for free. And it's like really helpful for you know, mobile applications where if the person is on a train, for example, the network is suddenly gone, doesn't matter. You can still you know, move around in, in his user profile and, and the, on the latest tweets or whatever and can still see stuff. Um, all right, so the final thing that I want to show today is how do you write data? We, have understand, we can understand now how to query data, even with variables. So how do we write data? Um, in the GraphQL world, this is not called a query. This is called a mutation. And so that's why you have to write mutation. And then, as before, I give it a name. So this is the mutation for the create view, right? Uh, and if you want to create a new message, there's one field, a text field, where you type in your message. So this is kind of like the form data that we are about to send to our GraphQL endpoint. And we say, like, the variable is called message, is type string. And this is the endpoint of our GraphQL uh, schema. So we would do like mutation, like new developer, no clue what's in the system, press control space. I only have one mutation, so it already completes to that one mutation that's available. I press brackets. It already tells me, you need to provide a message, right? Um, uh, and I say test. And when you send a request to your mutation endpoint, it comes back with a result as well. So what is the result? It has two fields, actually, form errors and a message. And we know that a message is also part of our schema. So we, we might only want to have the ID. Because you know I want to save the message, get back the new ID, and then you could like refresh the page and go to the newly created detail view of that ID. Okay? Um, or actually, in our case, I would just go back to the home page. So you, know, you can try that. Won't, oh, it even, hey, wait. This shouldn't work. Oh, no, of course it works, yeah, because I provided my variable here already. OK, so <clears throat> and I know this is pretty hard to digest now. Uh, it's already a lot of code, and you're all tired. <laughs> <laughs> but we are almost done. Only like two more slides with code, and then we are done. Um, in my component, I will, I will define a submit handler. So when the form is submitted, I need to do some magic, right? And first of all, I will prevent whatever the normal HTML form would do, I will just stop that um, event. Then I just use the HTML form data API to fetch all the data from my input fields. There's only one field. It's called message, right? Uh, and now, because of uh, Apollo and because of the decorator that we will use at the end, we have this.props.mutate available, OK? Um, because this is a mutation. and. Uh, we provide the variables that are necessary. You know, we have defined that our mutation re requires a variable, so we pass in that variable by using that form data thing again. 
And this is a promise. So when you call mutate, it's a promise. When the promise resolves, so you say uh, dot then in the end. Oh, sorry. Uh, what have I done? OK. When the promise resolves, you get access to the return query here, right? So you get access to uh, res.data.create message. And then there might be something in form errors, or maybe not if there are no form errors. And there might be something in message if you are successfully created a message. I think if I don't provide uh, any text here, there is something in form errors. Please provide a message. Okay, I designed the GraphQL backend that way. Um, so I will basi basically just check um, if there are form if there are no form errors. I will redirect to the home page if there are form errors. You know, you would usually use something like um, this dot set state. Um, errors, and then you put the form errors in here. So when you set the state, your component re-renders, right? Then you would, you know, put some kind of uh, form errors component down here. So when the component re-renders, the form error appears. Okay. So this is uh, it's really up to you how you actually display the form errors in your application. Um, okay. So that was the that was the submit handler, and then. Like in the other examples, I will replace the render function with something more meaningful. <coughs> so I'm essentially uh, just displaying a simple form like this, just one form and one button, right? So this is a very normal HTML form. It has two HTML input elements inside. Um, and it has this on submit handler here, which is the function that we have created up here. OK? Um, yeah. So oh, yeah. And before this works, we have to wrap our component in the Apollo decorator. And we have to remove the export default here. So this, this is the same thing as before, right? We use the GraphQL decorator uh, with this query, or in this case, with this mutation that we have created, and we wrap our component in, uh, inside. So now, uh, hopefully, there it is. It works. 